Hello everyone. Welcome to the first lecture of the fourth module, which is going to be on CMOS inverters. So CMOS inverters is kind of the essence of this course. If you understand CMOS inverters well, you can extend the same analysis for any other combinatorial logic circuit. So let us understand them well and let us go ahead. So the disclaimers remain the same. Now, this is how a CMOS inverter looks like. We kind of introduced it in the last lecture itself. So what I would say is it's a holy incarnation of the inverters. I mean, compared to all the other MOSFET based inverters with, you know, static MOSFET loads or resistor based loads, this is kind of the most promising form of stack, like most uh, promising form of inverter. And as I told before, also, if you learn this well, then you can always extend all these analysis that you have done for CMOS inverter and analyze even complex uh, combinatorial logic. So how this looks like, I mean, a simple switch kind of uh, representation of this. So when V equals to zero, what happens when V equals to zero, this is closed. Sorry, this is open. This switch is open. I mean, MOSFETs typically act like switch. So what is an ideal switch? Ideal switch has infinite off resistance. That is no current flows through it. And it has got some finite on resistance, which is pretty low, which is very small. And that we call as R on, right? And we told that R off is pretty high and R on is pretty small. So in this switch based representation of the CMOS inverter, when V equals to zero, when V equals to zero, it's less than the VTH of this NMOS. And therefore this is turned off. This is in cutoff mode. No current is sunk by it. And then what happens when this is zero, what is the value of VSG? So VSG is zero minus VDD. Sorry, the value of VSG is VDD minus zero. That is VDD. So when VSG is VDD, it is very greater than VTH P and as such, this shows you equivalent resistance, which is pretty small. And then what happens? Whatever load capacitor is here, it gets charged via this small resistance of the PMOS, and then our V out becomes equal to VDD. Now, what happens when V equals to one? When V equals to one, this VGS is equals to VDD, that is greater than VTH of N. So this is kind of connected by small resistance Rn. And what is VSG? VSG is VDD minus VDD, which is zero. And that is smaller than mod of VTHP. So if it's smaller than the mod of VTHP, this is in the cutoff mode and as such, it doesn't source any current. So this switch is kind of open. And what happens in this case, whatever charge was there on this load capacitor that gets drained to the ground with the help of this small like resistance Rn. So because of this, what we have, we have the OH equals to VDD, the OL equals to ground. So we have a full logic swing, right? So what exactly full logic swing gives us? It gives us high noise margin. <clears throat> also, we discussed that as long as this V in is less than VTH, or as long as this V in is greater than VDD minus VTHP, what happens? So as long as V in is less than VTH, this is kind of open, this switch is open, and we have VOH equals to VDD or V out equals to VDD. As long as this voltage V in is between VDH, like VDD minus VTH of P minus, I mean VDD minus mod of VTH of P to VDD, our effective VSG is less than mod of VTHP. So between zero to VTH of N and VDD minus mod of VTHP to VDD, it shows zero slopes. Why? Because in one case, when V in is less than VTH of N, the output fixed, output is fixed at VOS, that is VDD. And when the V in is between VDD minus mod of VTHP to VDD, this is cut off and the output is fixed at ground. VOL, like V out is fixed at ground, that is VOL. So it shows you zero slopes when the input is between, so output shows zero slope, dv out by dv equals to zero. It gets fixed at VDD and ground when the input is between zero to VTH of N and between VDD minus mod of VTHP to VDD. So in these regions, I mean, if your input has some noise also, then it doesn't affect the output, right? So that kind of noise immunity is also provided since it shows you zero slope. So it is kind of, you know, very close to the ideal inverter. Also another important part of this is that these logic levels are independent of the sizing of these MOSFETs. I mean, what exactly does the sizing change? So size of the MOSFET ratio of W by L or that only changes the current through it, right? So if the current changes, then obviously the slope will change. The slope with which, you know, the transition happens, that changes. However, the logic levels, that is the nominal logic level VOH and VOM, that doesn't change. Why so? Because even if this RP is somewhat larger, the time constant for charging this capacitor would change. But, at, but 
the effective value to which it will be charged, that will be VDD itself. Similarly, even if the ratio of W by L or you change the W and L values of this, what will happen? Its threshold voltage may change, its uh, current driving capability may change. So the rate at which this load capacitor will be discharged to the ground, that will change. However, it will be always discharged to the ground. So in static mode, this VOH and VOL values, they don't depend upon equivalent resistances or they are independent of the sizing of the MOSFET. As long as the MOSFET is behaving like a switch, you will obtain perfect values of you know, VOH equals to VDT and VOL equals to ground, irrespective of what is the size of this MOSFET. Okay, so this kind of logic where the output doesn't depend upon sizing of the MOSFETs or sizing of, of these uh, elements is called as ratioless logic. So we'll also be discussing about ratioed logic when we will be discussing, you know, uh, your uh, other combinatorial circuit design techniques. So another point that is very important for CMOS inverter, at any point of time during static operation, that is when your input is fixed at zero or your output is fixed at input is fixed at zero or input is fixed at one. That is your output is fixed at zero, like VOL, or output is fixed at VOH, which is VD. So at any point of time, in the static mode of operation, when your input is either V equals to zero or V equals to VDD, your output node is either connected to VDD through a small resistance RP, or it is connected to ground by a small resistance RN. So at all point of time in the steady state, it is this V out node is always connected to either VDD or ground by a small resistance. So what does that imply? That implies that it has got a very low output impedance. So if the output impedance is low, what we can say about it? Why, why do we want a low output impedance? So that you know we can drive multiple fan ops, right? So that is one uh, like you know advantage of this. Also, let us talk about the input impedance as well. So input impedance, looking from here, what we see is it's the gate oxide of this, like I mean the resistance is like the gate resistance of this and the gate resistance of PMOS and as well as the gate resistance of MMOS. Now the gate resistance is close to infinite, right? Because there's a layer of in insulator which separates your metal and your semiconductor, right? So if there's an insulator which is separating these two, then ideally the resistance of this gate is infinite. And as such, the input, like at the input, you see an infinite resistance. So that's the ideal case. And if you have an infinite amount, infinite input impedance, then what you can say about it, that you know it, they won't sink, they won't sink much current from this logic circuit. So if let's say this is driving out this circuit. Since its input is like showing infinite impedance, the circuit won't be sinking any current which is flowing through this. And as such, you can ideally drive large number of fan outs, ideally infinite. However, one problem is there. What? That we assume that you know no current is flowing through this gate insulator. But in modern MOSFETs, what happens? Your gate insulator thickness, along with reduction in you know the length and width. What, have, what people have done is they have also reduced the gate oxide thickness in order to achieve better gate control by increasing the electric field. So what exactly electric field depends upon? The smaller the gate oxide thickness, the larger is the electric field, right? So smaller the oxide thickness, higher the field effect, and as such, better control of the channel. So now what people have done is they have kind of reduced this you know, uh, gate oxide thickness to one nanometer SiO2. But because of that small, ultra small thickness, what happens? There can be some amount of tunneling. I mean, since oxide presents a huge barrier, so it cannot allow the electrons to flow over the barrier. But at the same time, since the thickness is pretty small, tunneling may take place. And because of that tunneling of electrons from this gate to the channel through this ultra thin oxide, what happens? It introduces another leakage component, which is called gate leakage. And this gate leakage is something that became a very important problem close to 2010 and now. So close to 2010, what people suggested was, instead of using SiO2 one nanometer, what people are now doing is they are using an ultra thin layer of SiO2 0.5 nanometer. Why 0.5 nanometer SiO2 has to be used? Because you know, other insulators, they don't have very good interfacial properties with silicon. So the silicon is the material of choice for even now, like for the transistors. So we need to have an oxide which has got pretty good like interfacial property, like less number of defects, interfacial states with silicon. So SiO2 is kind of, you know, God made SiO2 in that sense. So semiconductor engineers, they say that God made SiO2 
because SIO to SI interface is pretty good. Number of defects and all those things is pretty small. So even though we have to replace this SIO2 with a thick insulator, but what we do is we still keep 0.5 nanometer of SIO2. Why? Because the interfacial quality is pretty good. And after that, I mean, with 0.5 nanometer of SIO2, we deposit a layer of high K material. So high K material is HFOX, I mean, the materials which have a higher dielectric constant. So those materials can provide you higher electric field even when their thickness is higher. So that way, what we are ensuring is we are achieving the same levels of electric field by using materials with high, di high, high dielectric constant. At the same time, we are increasing their physical thickness. And tunneling kind of depends upon the physical thickness, as well as you know the electric field. Since the electric field is same, if the thickness is larger, then tunneling won't like tunneling will be small. So nowadays, the MOSFETs that we use, they are using high K metal gate technology. So you must be you know uh, encountering this term that high K metal gate technology. So metal gate is, the gate is made up of metal and not polysilicon. And high K, the dielectric is, the, the gate insulator is having a high dielectric constant. But at the same time, if you directly use a high K dielectric with silicon, it will give you a poor interfacial quality. So we have to use 0.5 nanometer silicon dioxide even there. Enough discussion on that process. Uh, let us just come back to this problem that, you know, we were discussing that this, because of this low output impedance and infinite, input impedance, ideally it can drive infinite fan outs, or I would say even in practical CMOS inverters, we can drive large number of fan outs. But when we are driving large number of fan outs, what, what's the problem? The problem is steady state doesn't detect. I mean, you'll get same steady state voltages, but the transient analysis degrades. I mean, the delay increases. Why the delay increases? So if you have several of these inverters connected to this node, their input capacitance would be presented as load to this, right? So here the load capacitance that will increase significantly and if the load capacitance is increasing and the resistance remains the same so effectively the time constant by which the time constant kind of increases significantly so if the time constant of charging a capacitor increases we can say that you know the delay would increase because we also found out in the last lecture that you know whenever we are using n mosfet and a resistor as a load or you know even other mosfets as a load then we saw that there was a large static participation right however in this case when the inputs are static, right? When the vein is zero or when the vein is VDD, you see this is the situation. So in this situation, ideally there is no connection between VDD and the ground. So it is cut off, right? In each of the case, VDD is kind of cut off from the ground. So in both of these cases, in static condition, ideally no current flows between VDD and ground. And as such, we say that there's no static power dissipation. However, we know that, you know, because of inefficiency of MOSFETs as switch, that is, you know, these switches, even if they're open, like even if we V in is less than VTH, we know that a leakage, subthreshold leakage current flows, and that contributes to some amount of uh, you know static leakage. Ideally, that was pretty small when we had to deal with long channel MOSFETs in the earlier times, 1990s, 2000s. But nowadays, with the evolution of these MOSFETs, I mean with ultra short channel MOSFETs, this subthreshold swing is kind of high. Subthreshold slope is kind of no, sorry, subthreshold leakage is kind of high. So in modern MOSFETs. You know, the subthreshold slope is close to 70 millivolts per decade, 65 to 70. For nano, uh, like these uh, nano sheet fits, people have achieved close to 62 to 63 millivolts per decade. So we have close to ideal subthreshold swing, but at the same time, the subthreshold leakage is quite high. So because of that, uh, you know, nowadays static power dissipation is something which is dominating the dynamic power dissipation. And even though we made this CMOS inverters, to have no static leakage, I mean, ideally, they should not have any static leakage. Nowadays, we, we see a lot, huge deal of leakage. Okay, so with this, however, it is quite a leap when compared to, you know, NMOS only logic. So now let us discuss further about this. So let us see its layout. So layout is something that you see, right? Layout is something that you make. In order to realize any uh, logic circuit on chip, what you make is you make it stop view, and then you send it to the foundry for fabrication. So the layout of a CMOS inverter looks something like this. So here, how do we define a MOSFET? So NMOS is, this is your active area, that is the doped area. And then this is your polysilicon gate. So this is how typically a layout of MOSFET looks like. You have an active area, which is a doped area. And then you have in, on top of it, I mean, in middle of it, a gate, which is running, which is polysilicon. So this is your uh, NMOSFET. And this is how your P MOSFET looks like. So for a P MOSFET, you should have an N well. So the substrate here is P. So you do not have a P well here. Here, since your substrate is N, so you need to make an N well, which is kind of your, which acts like your substrate. 
and then you have this doped area which is given by green or given by this yellow so why yellow because this is n plus dope this is p plus dope so we have to you know uh, differentiate the two so that is why we have shown it in two different colors and then this polysilicon gate is kind of there also now why we have connected these two polysilicon gates because here you see that you know these gates are connected right so since the gates are connected we have to do it even in the layout and then this is the contact for input IM, right and now its source is connected to VDD. So this is your VDD line, which is kind of metal one. So this source is VDD. And this is connected. Right? Its source is connected to VDD. Its drain is connected to the drain of this NMOS. So this is the drain of PMOS. This is the drain of NMOS, and they are connected. And this is connected to the output. This its input, I mean not the input. So its source. Source of the NMOS, it is connected to the ground, right? So this is how people typically make it, make the layouts. Now, one thing to note that you know you'll be finding that there are several contacts here, several contacts, not a single contact. So in large transistors, it's a norm to give these several contacts instead of one single contact. Why? First, because the current density would be very high if there's only one small contact here. So that may degrade its quality over time. So to spread the current, we have different contacts. And if there's only one contact, then the contact resistance is pretty high. If we have several contacts in parallel, the contact resistance is like number of contact, contact resistance of one of these contacts divided by n, right? Because they are all in parallel. So because of that, what happens? Effective contact resistance also reduces. So two way, like two reasons for having multiple contacts. First, effective current density reduces, so that doesn't degrade your contact property. Second, it spreads your current and also reduces your contact resistance. So because of these two reasons, we have like multiple number of contacts on a large transistor for source and drain regions. Okay, so with this discussion, let us go ahead and look at its PTC and try to examine its PTC. So first let us look at, you know, this P MOSFET, which acts like a dynamic load here, right? So it's not like a static load where we are just biasing it to the ground or we are you know, uh, using it as a static load. We are using it as a dynamic load. So its resistance is also dependent upon the input. That is why I'm saying that it's dynamic. So what exactly is this PMOS? We discussed it last time also. We are taking an enhancement, enhancement type PMOS spec with a negative VTP, right? Here what we do, we connect the gate to the input and we connect the source to the VDD, that is the supply, right? Because in PMOS spec, typically sources at a higher potential as compared to the ring. And we know for a fact that, you know, the load line is convex. And since the load line is convex for PMOS, we have steep slope. So a CMOS inverter will show you a steep slope. Now let us look at the equations for this CMOS inverter. So the IDS of P, the drain to source current of P is actually minus of drain to source current of N. Source to drain current of P is same as drain to source current of N. But if you talk about drain to source current of P, that is negative in direction to drain to source current of N. VGS is equals to V in for this M1. That is VGS of N is V in for this M1. For M2, VGS of P is what? V in minus VDD. So what can you say about, like, how can you say, what can you say about V in for VGS P? V in is simply VDD plus VGS. Similarly, VDS of N is V out and VDS of N plus v, VDS of P is equals to VDD, right? Or VDD minus this VDD minus this V out is your VSD. You're right. So if it, that is VSD, then VDSP is simply V out minus VDD. So like that, you can classify or you can write equations for this. So what we have to do? First, let us draw IDS of P. So IDS of P, you remember from our discussion that it's in the third quadrant, right? IDS is negative and VDS is also negative since the source is at a higher potential, right? So this is something like, this is how, you know, the output characteristics of a PMOS looks like. If you are just driving, like if you're just drawing IDS of P as a function of VDS of P. This is the maximum negative voltage, then it would be largest. Then uh, as you reduce, as you kind of reduce the magnitude of negative voltage, your current starts becoming smaller and smaller. And the norm here was, if the VGS is, more negative as compared to VTHP, that is also negative, then we say that the transistor is on. 
a whole layer accumulation, like a whole inversion layer has been created and the current is flowing. So larger the negative voltage, larger the, you know, uh, whole inversion layer that is created. So larger the current. So this is typically how, you know, your IDS and VDS curve that is uh, drain to source current versus drain to source voltage of a P-MOSFET looks like. Now let us take help of these equations and let us just transform it like the way we were doing. So even here, we will be taking this M1 as a primary element and taking this as the load and then transferring its properties on the same axis and then find out the operating points. So first, what we need to do since IDSP is minus of IDS of N and we have to draw it as a function of IDS of N and VDS of N. So first we mirror it around the X axis since IDN is equals to minus of IDP. So we first mirror it around. So it's so what it what it's like this. And now here it will be in the form of VGSP. So we also need to like you know uh, change this variable from VGSP to V in because in the case of NMOS, we'll be using different V ins and then drawing its output characteristics. So if we want to change this VGS for, from VGS of P to V in, we have to apply this transformation, right? So once we apply this transformation, V in is nothing but VDD plus VGS of P. So look at the difference here. So here, V in equals to zero, we are getting the maximum current. V in equals to 1.5, we are getting smaller current, right? In case of NMOS, what happens? V in, when V in equals to VDD, we get the largest current. V in is smaller, we get smaller current. So they're complementary of each other, right? So V in is larger, V in is larger, we get smaller current. V in is small, V in is zero, typically we get the maximum amount of current. Because then V in is like, you know, VDD minus V in, that is your VSD is highest. So that is how it works. So now we have transformed this axis from IDS of P to IDS of N. However, this is still VDS of P. Remember that this is still VDS of P. Also, we have transformed these variables from VGS of P to V in. So since this is a VDS of P, we need to transform it to VDS of N. So how can we transform it to VDS of N? So you just replace V out by VDS of N here. So it's just VDD plus VDS P, right? So we just have to shift it by VDD. Once we do that, you see, we have transformed the axis to IDS of N, VDS of N, and now this is how the load lines look like. This is for V in equals to zero, this is for V in equals to 1.5, and V in equals to 2.5, it will lie along this horizontal X axis. So this is how the transformation is done in case of, you know, this uh, CMOS inverter. Now let us, you know, overlap them and let us draw the VTC. So the overlap looks something like this. So let us individually look at NMOS characteristics and PMOS characteristics and then find out the operating points. So NMOS characteristics, V in equals to 2.5 volts, maximum V in, maximum current. V in equals to 0.5, small current, and V in equals V in less than VTH, it lies along this line, right? So V in equals to zero will lie along this x-axis. Let's take the case of PMOS. So for PMOS, V in equals to zero volt, VSG is maximum, maximum current. As you increase the magnitude of V in, the current decreases and if V in is between VDD and VDD minus VTHP, then VSG is kind of less than mod of VTHP and as such it lies along this axis. Current lies along this axis. And one more thing, this is, you know, here you can see that it's uh, like channel length modulation is there, that is, it's not perfectly constant, current doesn't saturate, it's not perfectly constant, it is kind of increasing with increasing VDS. So now that we know the different curves, the load line curves for this PMOS for different values of V in, and the output characteristics of NMOS for different values of V, in, let us now find out the operating points. So for one particular V in, v in, what exactly is the current that we are getting out of this system when they are placed in series, right? That is what we typically want. So how can we find it? So we just find out or we just look for the intersection when the same V in is there in both the characteristics. So V in equals to zero, you have this characteristics for PMOS. And V in equals to zero, what is the characteristics of NMOS? It lies along this line. So the first intersection would be here for V in equals to zero. Now let us take the case of V in equals to 0.5. So V in equals to 0.5, this is the characteristics for PMOS. And V in equals to 0.5, what is the characteristics for NMOS? It's this one. So they intersect here. Now let us take the case of V in equals to one. So V equals to one, this is the characteristics for NMOS. And this is the characteristics for PMOS. So the intersection point lies here. 
Let us go for higher values. So 1.5, this is the characteristics of N mass. This is the characteristics of P mass. So it lies here. Then two volts, this is the characteristics for N mass. And this is the characteristics of P mass. So you see it's gradually decreasing. I mean, uh, for P mass, the current is gradually decreasing. So the intersection points is like moving towards the origin. And what happens for 2.5, that is VDD. This is the curve for N mass. And for P MOS, between VDD and VDD minus mod VT of VTH of P, it lies along this x-axis. So you have this intersection point. Now, one point to note that you know these operating points, you see they are always present at the extremes. So they are present at the extremes, and in between you have a steep slope. Because there are no, like you know, they are uh, like the points are continuous over here. I mean, they are close to continuous over here, more so when channel and modulation is small. But the only point I want to say is that you know most of the operating points they lie at the extremes. So in the middle you have a sharp transition. Now let us also look at you know how to map these different intersection points onto the VTC and also what is the operating regime of these MOSFETs that is NMOS and PMOS at those points at those operating points. So for our reference, let us also draw this circuit. So this is the circuit that we are talking about. So when mean equals to zero, what we have exactly when mean equals to zero, M1 is in cutoff. Because it lies along this line, I mean, VGS is less than VTH. And what about M2? That is PMOS. So PMOS follows this curve. And below this saturating point, that is VGS minus VTH, here it would be, you know, VSG minus mod of VTHP. What exactly happens? It's in the linear region. So it's the resistive mode or the linear mode, right? So for V equals to zero, what happens? The NMOS is in cutoff mode and PMOS in the resistive mode. Because here it's VSG minus mod of VTHP. Like it, the voltage is the VDS is less than uh, VSG minus VTH of P. Now, till what point? Till this point, till VTH. Till VTH, it will remain at this intersection point itself, right? Now, what happens beyond VTH? So, beyond VTH, what happens? This NMOS also starts to sink some current. So, beyond this, what happens? This PMOS is kind of sourcing currents to this load capacitor. The NMOS is also sinking some current. But this voltage here is close to VDD, right? It's close to VOH, it's close to, close to VOH, like it's close to VDD. It's not exactly VDD, but it's close to VDD because some amount of current is also, you know, sunk by this M1. So what happens in this case? Here it's, if you talk about V in, so V in is just higher than VTH. You talk about its V out or VD, that is quite high, that is close to VDD. So here, what can we say? It's VDS is pretty large as compared to VGS minus VTH. So if VDS is larger than VDS minus VTH, what we have? NMOS is in saturation, right? Because it's VDS is greater than VGS minus VTH. What can you say about PMOS? So PMOS is still in the resistive mode, why? Because it's VDS or VSD is small as compared to VSG minus VTH, mod of VTH. So this is given by these points, I mean, these two points. So here you can see that still the characteristics of this PMOS is linear. However, those of your NMOS are in the saturation mode because it's VGS minus VTH would be somewhere here and they are like, you know, beyond that. So here your NMOS is in saturation while your PMOS is in linear or resistive mode. So when VIN equals to Vout equals to VM, what happens? Exactly your both transistor would be in saturation, why? Right? Because this VDS, let's talk about VSD of P. So when this is V in is equals to V out equals to Vm, then what is Vsd of P? Vsd of P is simply Vdd minus Vm. And what is exactly its Vsg? Vsg is Vdd minus Vm. So its Vsg minus mod of Vdhp would be always smaller than Vsd of P. Similarly, for this P mod, for, for, for this NMOS also, its Vds is Vm and its Vgs is also Vm. So it's Vgs minus Vth, that is Vm minus Vth of n would be smaller as compared to Vds. So both of them are in saturation. So it would be somewhere here. It would be somewhere at the middle where both are in saturation. So we can write about that, that you know, at Vm, both PMOS and NMOS are in saturation. Now, what about these higher voltages, like let's say 1.5 volts? So for 1.5 volts, what happens? You see the intersection over here. What happens? So here your NMOS is in linear, right? NMOS is in linear. And what about your PMOS? So PMOS is in saturation. 
Now, how, how can you say just by looking at the characteristics and by the input? So, for 1.5 as input, typically output would be smaller, right? Output would be uh, like close to ground. So, its VDS is small, VDS of NMOS is small. And what about VGS? So, VGS is higher because it's towards the you know higher side. So, VGS minus VTH is larger than VDS. So, what can you say about NMOS? NMOS should be leaner or resistive. What about PMOS? Since this output node is at a potential which is close to the ground, its VSD is quite high. However, its VSD is quite small. And VSD minus mod of VTHP would be even smaller. So, in that case, what happens? Your VDS of this is larger than this VGS minus VT. And therefore, what happens to this PMOS? It's in saturation. So, you can either get it from this curve or you can also, you know, just by looking at this curve and analyzing the different values of inputs and outputs, like probable values of outputs, you can find the operation regime. Now, what happens when you increase beyond, you know, VDD minus VTH of P? So, this, let's say this is VDD minus mod of VTH of P. So, if you go beyond this, what happens? This PMOS gets cut off. So, it follows this line. So, the PMOS is cut off. And what about the NMOS? So, NMOS is like this, right? NMOS is like this. So, NMOS is in the linear region itself. So, if you look at here, how you can derive it from here. So, once this VIN is greater than VD, VDT minus mod of VTHP, this transistor gets cut off. And as such, this is very close to ground. And then how can you say about the operating region of this? So, since this is very close to ground, then the potential difference across this is pretty small as compared to, you know, VGS, which is close to VDP. So, this is in the linear regime. So, NMOS is in the linear regime or the resistive mode and PMOS is in the cutoff. So, this is how, you know, we can derive the VDC of the CMOS inverter. Now, here you see that the slope is not that steep. I mean, there is a finite slope, it's large, but it's not that steep. Reason being here, we have considered channel modulation. However, if you do not consider this channel length modulation or if you somehow create a transistor, make a transistor which doesn't have this channel length modulation or where the channel length modulation is suppressed, that is 1 plus lambda VDS is suppressed, then what happens? Then this uh, VDC becomes pretty steep. Why so? Let us discuss that. So this is the curve which you will get when you know you, ha uh, you have no channel length modulation. I mean, here channel length modulation is not present. I mean, you have a device where channel length modulation has been suppressed to an extension, like to an extent that it is acting like a constant current source. So then you will give, then you will get this kind of curves. An intersection point, I mean, the extreme intersection points would remain kind of the same, but close to the VM value, you will find out that, you know, there's a flat kind of intersection, like flat region of multiple intersection points. If you just neglect channel length modulation or if you make a device where channel length modulation is suppressed. So this is the portion which shows you the ultra steep slope. Why so? Because the input is not changing much, but you see output is changing significantly. Here for same value VM, the output is changing by several volts. So several volts. So here, if you calculate the slope, it would be infinite, right? Now, how can we locate this steep part of this VTC? So locating the steep part of VTC is also very you know interesting. So what we know, we know for a fact that at VM, both MN and MP are in saturation. So both transistors, the N, like uh, the N MOSFET as well as the P MOSFET, both are in saturation when mean equals to V out equals to Vm. So in saturation, if channel length modulation is neglected, then there's no relationship between ID and your what? Between ID and your VDS. It only depends upon VGS. So current of both MOSFETs is independent of VDS or VSD for P MOS. And in that case, your dB out by dB in is infinite. Only when both are in saturation. So this is the constraint. So if first, if there is no channel length modulation, current is independent of VGS. Second, the slope is infinite. I mean, you achieve this kind of continuous range of operating voltages only between, only when you know both are in saturation. Because only in uh, only when both are in saturation, and there is no channel length modulation, you won't have any dependence on VDS. Otherwise, when they are in linear region, there is a dependence on VDS, right? So, as long as both of the MOSFETs are in saturation and channel length modulation is pretty negligible, then your dV out by dV in is very high or close to infinite. Ideally, it should be like infinite, but in reality, you have channel length modulation, so it's high. So, 
Well, uh, yeah, ideal like in real scenario, ID actually depends upon VDS or VSD, and the slope is finite but large. So how can we find out you know these two uh, like voltages like these two V out values like the range of the V out for which the slope is pretty steep? How can we find out that? So we know for a fact that you know this slope is ultra steep only when both are in saturation. So between V out three and V out one, that is the like end point of this transition region. We have both the transistors in saturation, so that's the condition. So we out less than we out one. Our n MOSFET will be in the linear mode. That is, it will get out of saturation. We out greater than we out of three. What happens? Your p MOSFET will be in the linear mode, right? Because here n MOSFET was cut off, then n MOSFET was in saturation, p MOSFET was in linear from here to here, and then p MOSFET becomes in saturation. So just above this, p MOSFET is in linear. Just below this, and MOS is in the linear. Mode. So this is when we are talking about the output, right? So we have to look at this axis while go like determining these operating points. So we know for a fact that both should be in saturation. Let us draw the uh, low tank characteristics. So for V equals to Vm, this is Vgs equals to Vm for n MOS. For P MOS, what will happen? This will become Vsg will become Vdd minus Vm, right? So this is the curve for Vdd minus Vm. And we see that you know there is a continuous range of intersection, and there are range of these operating points at this uh, like VM. And what are the boundaries? So the boundaries are you know when this N MOS gets into saturation and when this P MOS gets into saturation. So only in this regime, both of them are in saturation. So what is this value for N MOS? When does it get into saturation? It gets into saturation for long channel MOSFET. It's VGS minus VT. So what is it? VM minus VTM. So this. Point becomes Vm minus Vtm, so this V out one becomes Vm minus Vtm. What about this point? So this P MOS gets to your saturation when your V out three is Vdd minus Vsd of P, and what is Vsd of P? Vsd of P here becomes Vsd of P minus mod Vth of P in saturation, right? So V out of three is what? It's Vdd minus Vdd minus Vm minus v, mod of Vth of P. So this becomes close to Vm plus Vth of P, Vm plus mod of Vth of P. So a threshold voltage. So uh, in between, so from Vm to plus Vm plus mod of Vth P to Vm minus Vthn, you see that the like the slope is ultra steep, and this is ignoring the channel length modulation or considering devices where uh, you know channel length modulation factor is pretty small or we have suppressed is significant. Now let us talk about the inverter switching threshold, which is the VM. How to calculate it? So we know for a fact that at saturation, both the MOSFETs are in. So at VM point, that is V equals to V out equals to VM, both the MOSFETs are in saturation. So you just apply the formula here. We are neglecting you know one plus lambda VTs for first hand calculation. That is fine. So if you neglect you know uh, the channel length modulation factor and let R equals to root of KP by KN. I mean this KP and KN consist of you know uh, W by L. That you should understand. So this is um, mu n w by l c ox as well, and we are considering that c ox is same for both. Uh, let's not go there. So they are kind of uh, the oxide thickness and technology are same. So that. and let us denote this r by root of kp by km. Then what happens? Your vm simply becomes vdd plus r vtm minus mod of vtp divided by one plus r. Now what is this r? Since r is representing ratio of kp by km. Which is mu p w by l of p divided by mu n w by l of n. Obviously, it's under square root, but that represents what? That represents the relative driving strengths of the p mos and n mos. And what we want is ideally we want this Vm to be close to Vdd by two, right? Not close. We actually want it to be at the Vdd by two for symmetric noise margins. You know, because we want or we usually as imagine that. The supply at the ground is same as the like the noise at the ground. The noise levels at the ground level is same as the noise level at the supply rate, supply rate. So for that we want we consider or we make our circuits for symmetric noise margin. That is, if we want our uh, VM to be VDD by two, then what we want we want our VTN and VTP to be equal and R equals to one. So in that case, what happens? This becomes VDD by two, right? So in that case, what happens? We want R equals to one for Vm equals to Vdd by two. Now for making R equals to one, 
This factor has to be equal to one. That is Kn by Kp. The Kp by Kn has to be equal to one. That is Kp has to be equal to Kn. So if you write that W by L of P has to be equal to mu n by mu P W by L of N. Now typically what we do is since mu n by mu P is not exactly one. Since mu n by mu P is not exactly one, mobility of electrons is kind of higher as compared to mobility of holes. Therefore, what we do is we kind of increase this W by L of P as compared to W by L of N. So let's say that we are sizing our n mos as the minimum size MOSFET. That is, W is equal to W min, L is equal to L min, given by the technology node. For instance, let's talk about 180 nanometer technology. So for 180 nanometer technology node, the minimum channel length or minimum gate length is 120 nanometers. So there also there is this scam. I mean, if someone says that 180 nanometer technology is there, it doesn't mean that the minimum gate length is 180 nanometers. The minimum gate length is still 120 nanometers. So let's say that now we are taking W equals to W min 120 nanometers, L equals to L min 120 nanometers for our NMOS, that is its minimum sized. So what we do is to make, to satisfy this constraint, we resize this W by L of P by some factor, which is kind of given by mobility, ratio of the mobilities. Let's say the ratio of mobility is beta. So our W by L of P is beta times W by L of N. And how we kind of give this value beta, we make W is equals to beta W min and we take L equals to L min. So by that we kind of make you know, uh, this ratio as beta, which is equal to the ratio of mobility of you know, mu n and mu p. So this is typically how we design a CMOS inverter in order to have Vm at Vtd by 2. So this is one reason. Another reason is we want our TPLFs to be equal to TPHL, right? So for that, we want that you know, the driving strengths of these two transistors are same. So that is another reason we'll be discussing that in the next lecture when we discuss about the dynamic or I would say uh, the transient response of a CMOS inverter. Here in this lecture, we are just focusing on the static response. So even to have Vm equals to Vdd by 2, what we do is we kind of take this beta. How we take this beta? We take this beta as Kn dash by Kp dash as mu n by mu p, right? As I told here. And also we want our Vtn and Vthp to be equal in magnitude. That is also something that we match, like that we assume here. When we are saying when we are saying that you know r is equal to one, and then with this gives us Vdd by two. Now let us see how this beta or r can affect you know the Vtc. So let us draw the curves. So let's take the case when you know we have beta or r equals to one. So my Kn is one. In that case, the driving strength of NMOS and PMOS is equal. And as such, you know what happens? Both are equally strong. And the VDD is like the VM is in the middle of this output swing that is VDD by 2. Now let's take the case when R is less than 1. So when R is less than 1, what we can say? Driving strength of NMOS is larger. Driving strength of NMOS is larger. That is, NMOS kind of pulls this load capacitor voltage closer to the ground. So if strength of this is larger and it is able to pull it closer to the ground more efficiently, then what happens? This will shift, the VM will shift closer to the ground, right? So the out is pulled faster to the ground or as such, since its driving strength is like, you know, more as compared to PMOS, it's not able to keep this node value at high for a long time. And what happens? At a smaller value of V in itself, it is able to pull it towards the ground. And as such, the VTC moves towards left. So when R is less than 1, your VM is less than 0.5 VD. And the out is pulled down faster to the ground. Similarly, when R is greater than 1, your PMOS is stronger. When R is greater than 1, your PMOS is stronger. Then what happens? It is able to pull this V out towards VDD for a longer period of V. That is, the ability of this to sink the charge on this load capacitor and make this value V out equals VDD by 2, that happens at a higher voltage of V. Or to, so as to say, the PMOS is stronger, it is able to pull this node towards VDD for a longer amount of time, for a longer range of V in. And as such, V out is held higher for longer values of V in, and VM is greater than VDD by 2. So this is how, you know, you can shift your VTD, you, you, you can shift your uh, like VM, just by increasing the size, just by changing this R value. So if R is pretty small as compared to one, what happens? NMOS gets as strong as it can get. And as such, it pulls your VM close to VD of N. It cannot pull it below that because then, you know, the slope becomes zero and it doesn't lie on this V equals to V out. 
Similarly, when R is pretty high as compared to 1, that is P MOS is very strong, then it pulls this PM close to VT minus VTH of P. It cannot pull it beyond that because then again, the slope becomes, you know, uh, zero. So this was all about, you know, inverter switching threshold. Why we are talking about VM? Why we want to change VM? This will become clear in the next slides. So here, one of the assumptions that we have taken is there is no channel length modulation and this corresponds to long channel MOSFETs. Where, you know, uh, this VGS minus VT whole square, like the drain current saturates at VDS equals to VGS minus VT, VGS minus VT. However, now let us find out VM for short channel MOSFETs. Here, the situation would be different. Let's say that for VM that is close to VT by 2, both the MOSFETs are saturated, velocity saturated. In that case, the formula has changed significantly. And what we need to do is, we need to use those, the drain current formulas for N MOSFET and P MOSFET, add them up to zero. So here we are, see why we are adding them up to zero, because here we are talking about VDS sat and VGS sat. And we are not talking about, you know, VSG. So here it's VGS, VM minus VDT is your VGS. VD sat is your VDS, not VSG, right? So here we take this. So ideally what will happen? I, ISD is equals to, ISD of P is equals to IDS of N. Here what we are doing, IDS of N plus IDS of P is equals to zero. Both are same things. So if you solve for this VM from here, you'll get another expression for VM. So if you approximate it, I mean, you uh, approximate it, you get R VDD by one plus R, where R is KP VD sat P divided by KN VD sat of N. So here this additional component, VD sat P and VD sat N also get here. I mean, uh, this R is something which consists of these two additional components apart from KP and KN. And we want R equals to one here also for EM equals to VDD by two, that is we want symmetric, you know, uh, NMOS and PMOS performance. For that, WL of P, ratio of WL of P to WL L of N, that is the beta factor there, has to be close to this. Now let us, uh, you know, talk about this VM for some time. So what exactly happens, even if you are changing this beta ratio, W by L of P to W by L of N ratio, by let's say, uh, let's say that for ideal or uh, for symmetric, or for let's say VM equals to VDD by two, you want the beta to be two. That is, you want your W by L of P to be twice of W by L of N. However, even if you calculate VM for, you know, beta equals to 1.8 or beta equals to 2.2 or beta equals to 1.7, beta equals to 2.3, you'll find out that VM is still pretty close to VD by 2. So VM is relatively insensitive. That is, even if, VD, even if beta is like not 2 but 1.5, then also VM is close to VD by 2. It doesn't, de it, it doesn't change significantly. So slight variation in the value of beta doesn't change VM significantly. And as such, since we want as small area as possible, typically in the industry, what we do is, we use values which are slightly less than that required for exact symmetry to save something somewhat on area as well because area is also something which is important i mean you want symmetric behavior at the same time area is also something which is important so we slightly reduce the value of beta such that vm is nearly equal to vd by 2 at the same time we want symmetry but we also want to reduce the area so we play this trick and that is why it is important you know analyze these you know, sensitivity as well. Because for design, there are several factors that you have to consider. And unless you are, you know, thorough with these things, you won't be able to design it perfect. Or to, you know, uh, cater to your consumer's need. Now we have been discussing about VM. How can we tune this VM by changing the relative strengths? But why do we need to tune VM? That's the problem, right? Why, why do we want to even tune VM? We want it ideally to be symmetric at VD by 2. So you remember one question in mini quiz? So if one rail is pretty noisy than the other, we have to tune VM in order to work well, even in the presence of that noise, right? So let's take an example here. There, the question was, supply rail was 20% more noisy. Here, let's take an example where, you know, the ground is more noisy as compared to, you know, this is your VM. So here, VM. So here, your supply rail is not noisy, but the ground is too noisy. So if we have the threshold voltage at the middle, I mean, if we have the inverter switching threshold at VM, which is 3D by 2, you'll see this kind of output. So the output will be erroneous, right? However, if you shift your threshold VM, I mean, inverter switching threshold here, if you increase it, how can you increase it? 
So how can you increase the switching threshold? You can increase it by increasing the driving strength of PMOS, right? So if you increase it by increasing the W by L of P as compared to W by L of N, then what happens? Then you see that the output is not erroneous. So in scenarios where you know one rail is more noisy than the other, it's not a symmetric situation. Both rails are not equally noisy. In that case, we have to tune the VM. Here the situation was ground rail was noisy, and then the output becomes too noisy for VM into stability by two. That is symmetric structure, and that is why we have to adjust the VM to get the correct response. So this is one situation. You know. CMOS inverters also become a very good sense amplifiers, very compact sense amplifiers. And for that, the property of tuning this PM to small amounts, that becomes really important. So you'll see that for you know some uh, DRAMs also, you can use asymmetric inverters, asymmetric CMOS inverters as a sense amplifiers. And how we can change VM is simply by changing the relative driving strengths. And it is important even for sense amplifiers, not only for your know, Designing in noisy environments, asymmetric noisy environments. Now let us talk about the impact of process variations. We we told initially we discussed about it that the process variation that is you know the tools incapability to produce same features on each of the uh, MOSFETs fabricated on chip that leads to shift in the threshold voltage. Right, that is what we discussed. And because of that shift in the threshold voltage, what happens if you look at the VTC of like inverters when the threshold voltage has been shifted? Then what happens? The VTC doesn't change much. I mean, obviously there is a shift in the VM because change in the threshold voltage simply changes your driving capability. Your driving capability is dependent upon VGS minus VT, right? If your VT is changing, then VGS minus VT will change, and as such, the driving capability changes. However, even in the presence of variation, that is, even in the presence of these different threshold voltages for different inverters, for different MOSFETs in different inverters across the chip, your VTC is kind of same. Your VTC doesn't degrade. I mean. Obviously, there's a shift in VM, but the nature remains same, right? If let's say this is the case for nominal, like for nominal, that is, you know, when the VTs are matched and it is uh, as per the design, let's say this is a nominal CMOS inverter. What happens when you have a poor PMOS, strong MOS, then it shifts towards ground? What do I mean by poor PMOS? So its VTHP would have increased. So its driving capability would have been reduced. Or the VTH of this MOS would have reduced because of process variation. So those things can constitute this kind of VDC. VM shifting towards ground. For VM shifting towards VDD, we'll have a strong PMOS that is VTH of that may have reduced or NMOS VTH may have increased. So these two are probabilities, right? Because you know, uh, you can have both increase in the VTH as well as reduction in the VTH because of process variations. So process variation, the change of driving capability because of shift in VTH, the only shift VM, the nature of the VTC doesn't change and it doesn't affect as such the operation. So now let us talk about the input high voltage and the input low voltage, right? These are the other important points, right? These are the other important points of the VTC. So how we defined them was, we defined that, you know, VIH is whenever dv out by dv in is minus one. Whenever dv out by dv in is minus one, there are two points on the VTC. One of them is VIH, one of them is VIH. However, if you go ahead and do that dv out by dv equals to minus 1, that will become quite clumsy. I mean, since the expression involves 1 plus lambda VTS and all, so the equation becomes quite clumsy. So for first-hand calculation, what people do is they kind of estimate that this kind of curve of the ideal inverter VTC, like it's not the ideal inverter VTC. So for CMOS static inverter VTC, which goes like this, I mean, there are some curves like this. What they do is they represent it by piecewise linear approximation. So in piecewise linear approximation, what people do is they say that you know they replace this region, the transition region, by a region of constant gain. And what is that constant gain? That constant gain is the gain which was present in the original CMOS inverter at V in equals to V out equals to Vm. So they replace this transition region by a slope which is constant, that is G. And what is that G? G is the slope which you would have obtained in the original CMOS inverter characteristics when V in is equals to V out equals to Vm. So it's dV out by dV in at v, v in equals to V out equals to Vm. That is your G. This is how you kind of you know represent any CMOS characteristics, any CMOS static CMOS inverter characteristics by making it piecewise linear. Although it introduces small error, 
it is quite well it works fine for first hand calculations so once you do that then let us find out our values of vih and vil so let us do that by just you know looking at the slope of this line so what is the slope slope of this line is simply voh minus vol like this minus this i mean y2 minus y1 by x2 minus x1 that is the slope right so g is what voh minus vol divided by vil minus vih so if you do this it comes like this they have just changed it so g is equals to voh minus vol by vil minus vih or minus of you know vih minus vil so if you do this and if you calculate it it simply becomes vih equals to vm minus vm by g and vil equals to vm plus vp minus vm by g now what is noise margin high noise margin high is simply voh minus vih so vdd minus vih noise margin low is simply vil minus vol that is vil minus down which is vil now why do we want a high gain first of all we need to find this gain right we need to find this gain in order to find this noise margin high and noise margin low because we need to find vih and vil but why do we want a high gain because if the gain is high then this term and this term ceases to zero and we have vih equals to vm and vil equals to vm and vm is equals to vdd by t so we have equal noise margin and the characteristics are you know close to ideal cmos inverter ideal inverter actually, not ideal cmos inverter ideal inverter okay so now we need this gain in order to calculate the values of noise margin high and noise margin low so how can we find out this gain so for finding out this gain what we need to do is we need to write the expression for you know when these two mosfets are at vm that is when these two mosfets are at saturation and there we also need to consider this channel length modulation since we are talking about practical mosfets and then we write that and then what we do we just derive we just take the derivatives with respect to vm so gain is what gain is gain is simply d out by dv just derive just take the derivative with respect to b assume vtm is equals to vtp equals to vt and then do this calculation what you'll find out is that you know you'll find the expression for gain basically and you know uh, you can further simplify this expression how you can approximate it how for you know uh, for v equals to vm ignoring clm what we get is we get this expression between vdt minus vm minus vt and vm minus vt so using these expressions you can further simplify it and get this dv out by dv in that is the gain as minus of these values right i mean minus of this particular expression i mean you can also derive it at lower end and find whether this is correct or not now just by looking at this expression you can find out that the gain is a strong function of channel length modulation right smaller the channel length modulation larger is this so this uh, gain depends upon channel length modulation larger the channel length modulation factor smaller is the gain and smaller the channel length modulation factor larger is the gain and you see that it can be tuned the gain can also be tuned by changing the size and the vdd because vm depends upon vdd right vm is here vm here is a function of vdd we want it typically to be r by 1 plus r times vdd so it is a function of vdd right so increase the vdd you increase the vm and that is also how you can increase the scope anyways so now let us talk about what exactly happens if we scale the supply voltage of this car, if of this uh, cmos inverter so let us take two cases first when the supply voltage is 2.5 1.5 and 0.5 and second when the supply voltage is less than that that is 0.2 0.1 and 0.05 volts and here for comparison we are comparing iso vt things i mean the threshold voltage we are assuming that threshold voltage is not changing only the supply voltage is changing in both these cases so as i told in the previous slide also vm is a function of vdd right you increase vm you kind of increase your vm and here if you increase your vdd what happens if you increase your vdd your vm kind of increases and this reduces the gain so gain increases with a reduction in vdd that is if you reduce vdd your vm reduces and as such this gain increases now reducing vdd may appear promising because not only this gain improves so here the gain was high sorry here the gain was small you see that the slope becomes quite steep for a lower value of vdd so for a lower value of vdd the gain improves the slope becomes steep also if your vdd is smaller we can reduce the energy dissipation 
but at the same time you know the delay increases because vdd is smaller current that you can drive into the capacitor that is smaller so your delay increases and it increases significantly also when you are reducing your vdd you are kind of making your signal to noise ratio quite small right because your noise remains fixed at least the fixed noise sources not i am not talking about those dependent noise sources which are dependent on the string the fixed noise sources their magnitude will remain same and you are reducing the vdd which is the maximum level of signal so at, by doing that you are kind of reducing your signal to noise ratio and you are making your circuit more sensitive to variations and external noise sources and let me tell you that because of variations the variations put a significant amount of you know a uh, constraint while reducing the supply voltage that we will discuss when we are discussing sram but that is something that you should know now you may wonder that you know when your you know vdd supply voltage is less than threshold voltage then the gates may not work because what we told was if your vdd is less than vt that is if your input is less than vt what we have we have no current right but that's not the case a sub threshold leakage current flows so even when the threshold voltage like even when you scale your supply voltages below the threshold voltage sub threshold currents can flow and they'll be able to make you know these transitions from 1 to 0 and 0 to 1 so you won't have you know that problem that cease to act as inverter no even below the threshold voltages if you keep the supplies then it will try it will act like an inverter however the currents are pretty small and the delay would be pretty high but it will continue to act like an inverter however what happens around 100 millivolts or so there's a major deterioration in the gate characteristics you can see that you know till this point it was working fine but below 100 what happens you see that the rail to rail supply is not there right? the voh and vol are not vdd and ground what happens basically thermal noise and all coming to picture their impact increases and voh and vol they cease to be at the supply rails and the transition gain transition region gain that also reduces and it approaches one so to achieve sufficient gain in a cmos inverter your vdd mean should be greater than 2 to 4 times thermal noise voltage like kt by q and below this what happens thermal noise may lead to unreliable operation what is the v i i mean if you want to further reduce i mean if you want to further reduce you know the vdd what can we do let's go for cryogenic circuits let's go for cryogenic circuits which are typically used in quantum computing so let's reduce the temperature let's operate at some millikelvin of temperature then we can actually you know reduce the vdd further 